As uh, John said, my name is Lee Freeman. I'm the local historian at the Florence Lauderdale Public Library over in Florence. And this is what happens when I volunteer to pinch hit if he ever needs a speaker. <laughs> so, but I've already had most of this program done beforehand, but I did a little bit of extra research over the weekend. I had a four day weekend, and boy, did that pay off. <laughs> so, I'm going to be talking about sinking the Dunbar fact and folklore. And I'm going to stand here because I forgot to get a remote control from the library before I left. And this is a slide of an article by Mrs. A.J. Darby from the Tri-Cities Daily of Sunday, March 4th, 1962, called Highways and Byways of Lauderdale County. And under the section Gunwellford Road, or some people call it Gunwellford Road, she writes, quote, in April 1862, during the war between the states, the Dunbar, a fast side-wheel steamboat under the command of Captain Fowler, was shelled on the lower Tennessee by heavy guns of a federal boat. In order to avoid the Tyler, the Dunbar hit up Cypress Creek. On seeing that she was discovered, she was immediately sunk by her own crew. This was near the place where Cypress Creek was usually forded. Only the gunwales of the Dunbar remained above water. Someone combined the two words, gunwale and ford, and gave a new name to the road. For the past 100 years, it has been known as the Gunwale Ford or Gunwalford Road. And as I understand it, over the past 30 or 40 years, divers have actually died for this wreck at the mouth of Cypress Creek. And they found the remains of an old barge, but they didn't find the gun bar, and we'll see why in a moment. Uh, I got a lot of good information on the Dunbar. This article really helped me out. It's an article from the Alabama Review of October 1985 by Turner Rice, who has connections with Florence. I think he was then living in Birmingham. He wrote an article called The Adventurous Career of the CSS Dunbar, and he did pretty good research. He went through the official record of the War of the Rebellion and uh, the record of the navies and got a lot of good research on the Dunbar. So that really helped me out with this program. Uh, then there was some really good online stuff, like uh, a chapter called from a book called The History and Archaeology of Two Civil War Steamboats, the Ironclad Gunboat USS Eastport, which will come up in a moment, and a steamer. Oh, uh, and I cut off that other one anyway. It's, it was, oh, and the steamer Ed F. Dix by Charles F. Pearson, Charles E. Pearson, and Thomas C. C. Burchett. They wrote an article or a book about these two steamers, and I found chapter two online, and I thought I would just put this on there just so you could see what the pay rate was for members of the Union Navy on a gunboat in the various, uh, the various jobs that they did. Uh, under the engineer ratings, the first class fireman got $30 a month, second class fireman got 25, the coal heaver got $20, Carpenter got $22 a month. A, a seaman got $20 a month. An ordinary seaman got $16 a month. Cabin boy got $10 a month. So you can see, you know, how how they were paid uh, on a Union gunboat. And I don't know if the, the Confederates were probably close to that, if maybe not exactly, exactly, but I thought that was interesting. Well, we're talking about the Dunbar. It was built in 1859 at Pittsburgh for the Monongahela River trade by Mr. John S. Pringle. The Dunbar was a 164 foot long, 27 foot wide side wheeler with a clipper bow and transom stern armed with two 12 pound rifle guns. Her original owner and master from at least 1859 to 1862 was Captain Littleton Augustus Gus Fowler. In 1860, the Dunbar was sold to a Maduka, Kentucky consortium owned by Gus Fowler and his four brothers. In December of 1861, the Dunbar was purchased for the Confederate Navy in Nashville along with the steamers James Wood and James Johnson and about four others by Lieutenant Isaac N. Brown of the Confederate States Navy. Upon the Confederate Congress's appropriation of $500,000 to buy steamers for conversions into gunboats. So they had to take these steamers in until a few months previous, or even a few days previous, 
had been in the mail packet and passenger train and convert them into gunboats. The Dunbar served the Confederate command near Fort Henry until the surrender of Fort Henry and, and Hyman in February 1862. And just to see what, uh, what a ship would look like, this is the section of the, a section of the hull of a typical mid 19th century side wheel steamer like the Dunbar. You can see the, the paddle wheel boxes on either side, the pilot house at the very top, the hold at the very bottom, and a side view, sort of a plan looking, plan and side views of the steamer Buckeye State, which would have been not exactly to the specs of the Dunbar, but fairly close. They have the same general shape and configuration. Yeah. And uh, there are no known pictures of the Dunbar. Uh, the articles that I've consulted say there are no known pics. I searched, you know, Fold 3 and the internet and did not find any. Well, this is an article uh, from the Evansville, Indiana Journal of Wednesday, September 5th, 1860, page four, before the Dunbar went into Confederate service, talking about the fact that she is in port and will be receiving freight until 12 o'clock when she leaves for Paducah. The, the Dunbar in particular made the Evansville to Paducah run. The Dunbar is one of the fleetest, handsomest, and most commodious boats afloat, and her passengers will find everything arranged with special reference to their comfort. She is in charge of Captain Gus Fowler, a very gentlemanly and efficient officer. With the popular clerk, Gus Dussache, assisted by Mr. Glenn and Davis in the office. And then it lists the agent if you want to book passage. And as we've already mentioned, the, the Dunbar was purchased by Captain Lipton Augustus Gus Fowler in 1859 for the Evansville and Paducah mail train to take the place of his earlier ship, the Silver Star. So this is the article from the New Orleans Daily Picayune from December 1859 talking about uh, Fowler's purchase of the Dunbar and then that's a picture of Captain Fowler himself. Captain Fowler was a, a, a Paducah, Kentucky native. He was the son of the Honorable Judge Wiley P. and Esther Fowler. Um, Fowler had several siblings, including five brothers. His brother, J. White Fowler, was captain of the CSS Little Rebel of the Mississippi River Fleet, which was captured at Memphis in 1862. Uh, captain Fowler, Gus Fowler, was captain of the Silver Star in 1859. The Dunbar between 1859 and 1862, the Armada in 1868 after the war, the John Alone's Day in 1869, and the Idlewild in 1870 all after the war. There's another Dunbar advertisement. According to advertisements like this one, the Evansville Daily News of September 8, 1860, the packet steamer Dunbar would leave Evansville every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 12 a.m. and left Paducah, Kentucky, or p.m., 12 p.m., and left Paducah, K Kentucky on uh, Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays at 9 a.m. Now, after the war started, very soon after the war started, some steamboats were given a dispensation by the Union military to pass their inspection checkpoints without being guarded or inspected on the river. The five Fowler brothers were pro-Confederate and were using the Dunbar to transport supplies for the Confederacy to Paducah. Captain Gus Fowler was warned by Al Robinson, surveyor of customs at Evansville, Indiana, on behalf of the Union government that he was breaking Union regs. Thus, the Dunbar was liable to search and seizure by Union authorities. In August of 1861, during a time of low water, the steamer Samuel Orr filled in for the Dunbar, but because the Samuel Orr was flying the Stars and Stripes, 
and despite assurances of safe conduct by Captain Fowler and his brothers, while the oil was filling in for the Dunbar, it was seized by Confederates led by the Fowler brothers at Paducah in retaliation for the earlier seizure of the pro-Confederate steamer W.B. Terry by the pro-Union steamer Lexington. You got all that? <laughs> the oars Captain McClurg and her crew were put ashore by the Fowlers and their pro-Confederate crew who then took over their ship. So there was a lot of, and I've read of just a little bit about what was going on between Evansville and Paducah on the river in the early months of the war, and it's really fascinating what was going on up there. This is from the, uh, from the Florence Gazette of Wednesday, January 29, 1862, from an article called by Telegraph, where the correspondent of the Union and American newspaper reported that the steamer Dunbar had been reported by their Fort Henry correspondent on January 19th, headed down the Tennessee River. This is the earliest reference I can find during the war to the Dunbar. And we've mentioned Fort Henry uh, several times. Oh, let me go back. Lieutenant Commander James Shirk, U.S. Navy, commanding the gunboat USS Lexington, reported on January 24th, 1862, that on January 21st, quote, at the request of General Smith, I proceeded up the river for the purpose of ascertaining the truth of a report, which was to the effect that Fort Henry had been evacuated. I had not gone farther than three miles from the camp before I discovered the rebel gunboat Dunbar under steam going up the river. I immediately gave chase and dropped a six inch shot just astern of her as she was rounding an island in the river which hid her from us. As she is a very fast boat, her speed being equal to one and a half times that of this vessel, the Lexington, I lost sight of her. I proceeded up the river to the foot of the island below the fort and then could see again the Dunbar and another steamer at the fort. In his report, Lieutenant Commander Shirk also noted that, quote, while at Aurora, downriver from Paducah on the Tennessee River, I heard that the Dunbar carried two brass pieces. This and the reported silence of the mast battery at the foot of an island below Fort Henry induced me to believe that she, the Dunbar, had the same guns which once composed that battery. The Dunbar has not yet been altered. She has no bulwarks and has still her upper cabin or saloon in its place. She is painted white and looks like any other river steamboat. So by this point, they still hadn't actually converted the Dunbar into uh, an actual gunboat. And as we've mentioned Fort Henry several times, this was probably one of the first key battles in the Western theater of the war. The Battle of Fort Henry on February 6, 1862, was the first significant Union victory of the war. In an effort to gain control of rivers and supply lines west of the Appalachians, Union General Ulysses S. Grant and Commodore Andrew Foote launched an attack on the lightly defended Fort Henry, which you can see outlined in red, and then Fort Donaldson to the northeast above it. Uh, Fort Henry in Tennessee, after a fierce naval bombardment, Confederate Brigadier General Lloyd Tillman secretly evacuated the bulk of his troops to nearby Fort Donaldson before surrendering to Union forces. The fall of Fort Henry, followed 10 days later by the capture of Fort Donaldson, opened up both the Cumberland and Tennessee rivers to Union control, cutting off Confederate access to two key waterways for the remainder of the war. And this is really the crucible that set everything else going. And on the map, you can see Forts Henry and Donaldson, you can see Paducah and Cairo not far away. And this will have repercussions for us down here in the Tennessee Valley. This is a map from 1883 showing McNary and Hardin counties and the Tennessee River, which runs through the edge of Hardin County in several places on the river that the Union flotilla, which was chasing the Confederate steamer Dunbar, stopped as they were chasing the Dunbar up the Tennessee River. They stopped at Saltillo, at Cerro Gordo, and then they kept going and eventually made it to Lauderdale County. 
And this is another, uh, I think this is from the official record atlas showing several of the key locations associated with the Dunbar East Fork in Mississippi, which was hugely important to the war efforts. <coughs> it was a staging area and it was on the river. And you see Chickasaw, which later was known as Riverton, which was mostly flooded by TVA in the 1930s and 40s. Then you can see Waterloo just up the river from Eastport, then Florence and Tuscumbia. Well, there was a man named A.M. Trammell, or Trammell, of the 15th Arkansas, who was an escapee of Fort Henry on the Dunbar, and he reported that the Dunbar was pursued to the railroad bridge over the Tennessee River near Fort Henry, and that seven shots were fired at her but missed. According to Trammell, she reached Florence at 11 o'clock Friday night. Other sources say she reached Florence, Alabama at four o'clock in the afternoon. At which point, Trammell, quote, immediately took the railroad train and came down to Memphis, unquote. So he jumped the train in Florence and headed back to Memphis, where he apparently made it back to Arkansas and enlisted in February of 1863 in Company A of Crawford's Arkansas Cavalry, Confederate States. I looked for his service records from the 15th Arkansas and couldn't find them, but I did find what I believe is him, where he re-enlisted in Crawford's Company A of the Arkansas Cavalry. Yeah, that can't be two, two guys with that, with that name. Now, the actual gunboat battle in the wake of Fort Henry took place on February 8, 1862, and it was reported in our very own Florence Gazette by editor Silas G. Barr. And I'm not going to read that whole article, but I just got a few key paragraphs I want to read. First of all, it says, a great excitement in Florence, citizens leaving, three steamboats burnt, two others sunk, two Yankee gunboats at our landing, three or four shells fired, but nobody hurt. And in his article, among other things, editor Barr wrote in part, quote, the black, ugly things wrapped as they were in the habiliments of death and mourning well represent the principle upon which this unholy war is waged for the destruction of Southern rights and lawful interests. A fire was then kindled upon the holy altar of patriotism that found a hearty response in every heart except the disappointed pursuers. The gunboats fired three or four shots, but at what they fired, we do not know. When it was certainly known that the gunboats were coming, a good many of our citizens took their movable goods and went to the country for safety. Some reported that 10,000 Yankees were in town, some 20,000 and that they were destroying everything before them. <clears throat> One fellow affirmed that he saw 27 gunboats land here on Sunday evening with his own eyes. And Barr points to that as, a, as a, an example of how rumors get spread in a time of crisis. Uh, the, uh, Barr indicates that the Union gunboats stayed about three hours at the Florence Wharf, and then they left after they had done their business. And in this picture, we will see Lieutenant Commander Seth Le Ledger Phillips. So, so what, I'm sorry, one, one thing I saw in the article, and I had forgotten this, but it mentions the forward where it was scuttled. Yeah, right? and I'm going to get to that. So. Okay, that's fine. That's in this great line of light. Yeah. Well, this is Commander Seth Ledger Phelps of the U.S. Navy, who was in command of the Union flotilla that chased the Dunbar down Cypress Creek. Um, and that's his ship at that point, the USS Conestoga. He was later given command of the Eastport, which we'll see in a moment. And there were actually three Union gunboats that pursued the Dunbar up the Tennessee River. The USS Tyler with uh, Lieutenant Commander William T. Gwynn in command. The USS Lexington with Lieutenant Commander James W. Shirk in command. And the USS Conestoga with Commander Lieutenant Commander uh, S.L. Phelps in command. The Tyler remained in Cerro Gordo with Hardin County to guard the captured Confederate steamer Eastport, which was at that point being converted into a gunboat for the Confederate Navy. Phelps and Shirk on their gunboats proceeded to Florence, and in his uh, re official report to his superiors, Lieutenant Commander S.L. Phelps says in part, 
quote, soon after daylight on the 8th, we passed Eastport, Mississippi, and at Chickasaw, farther up near the state line, seized two steamers, the Sally Wood and the Muscle. We then proceeded on, to, on up the river, entering the state of Alabama and ascending to Florence at the foot of the Muscle Shoals. On coming inside of the town, three steamers, the Juliet, Smith, the Kirksman, and the Time, were discovered, which were immediately set on fire by the rebels. Some shots were fired from the opposite side of the river below. A force was landed and considerable quantities of supplies marked Fort Henry were secured from the burning wrecks. Some had been landed and stored. These I seized, putting such as we could bring away on board our vessels and destroying the remainder. No flats or flatboats or other craft could be found. I found also more of the iron plating intended for the East Port, which they had captured at Cerro Gordo. A deputation of citizens of Florence waited upon me, first desiring that they might be able to quiet the fears of their wives and daughters with assurances from me that they should not be molested, and secondly, praying that I would not destroy their railroad bridge. As for the first, I told them that we were neither ruffians nor savages, and that we were there to protect them from violence and to enforce the law, and with reference to the second, that if the bridge were away, we could ascend no higher up the river. We had seized three of their steamers, one the half-finished gunboat, and, and forced the rebels to burn six others loaded with supplies, and their loss with that of the freight is a heavy blow to the enemy. Two boats are still known to be on the river and are doubtless hidden in some of the creeks where we shall be able to find them when there is time to search. We returned the night of the 8th to where the East Port lay. Unquote. And in his, uh, we, we also know from other sources that when the Union delegation uh, debarked, they also uh, dispatched several hundred pickets from Florence to Tuscumbia, crossing the railroad bridge via the Memphis and Charleston Railroad Bridge to, the form a, to uh, form a defensive cordon and that the Union officers seized, or the Union Navy seized the Florence Telegraph Office, which was connected to Tuscumbia. 